Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Accelerate webinar series hosted by the University of Denver's Daniels College of Business Executive Education Department. I'm Camila Angelini, Assistant Director of Business Development, and it is great to be back here with you today. The Accelerate webinar series is designed to help you accelerate your capacity to deliver results for your organization um, and for, for the people around you. We call on some of our best faculty to provide you with insights relevant to your particular context. This webinar will be about 25 minutes. We will start with a brief presentation and then move to questions and answers at the end. I have to say that we love the interaction during the webinar and all the comments and questions that you send, but to make it easier for all of us to see those questions, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions at any time and we will address them at the end. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, please know that we will try to answer them offline and get back to you with an email on that. In addition, I wanted to let you know that this will be recorded and we will send you an email with the recording afterwards. Today, we're pleased to welcome Michael Myers. Mike is a teaching associate professor at the Daniels College of Business Marketing Department. He's been in the digital marketing industry for over 20 years and consulting for over 10. Mike is the expert on everything digital and usually makes me feel pretty outdated with all his knowledge on technology in the digital world. Mike, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Um, hope everybody's having a good day. Um, I know everybody's trapped at home. I know personally my place is the cleanest it's ever been. So uh, hopefully your place is, uh, um, you're enjoying your time at home. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna talk about uh, artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence in the workplace, um, this is a topic that continues to evolve and move forward. And so it's a pretty exciting time um, for all of us in the industry. So we're excited to share this, uh, some of the insights with you today. So we're gonna cover machine learning. We're gonna talk a little bit about deep learning and examples of how those are being used in business. And I'm gonna give you some resources and just a little piece of advice as far as how to stay up to date and um, things to think about. So also this deck will be made available to you at the end of the presentation as well. So I like to start this off with a little humor because a lot of people that think about artificial intelligence as it relates to their jobs tend to get a little freaked out. So um, I'm pretty sure the matrix is not a documentary, but um, kind of gives you a sense of where people's, a lot of people's heads are at. I did not create this meme. So uh, I pulled these stats from an MIT article. If you click on this image, it will sh uh, take you to the resource. This is an MIT article from yesterday, and it talks about uh, areas of business where AI is being used, AI technology is being used. And so um, the darker number is 2019, the lighter number is 2022. And so customer service is definitely one of the bigger ones. Um, IT management, we've got research and development, uh, manufacturing operations, sales and marketing, actually a pretty steep decline, which is interesting, but um, that might be because things that are implemented are working really well. So there may be no need to um, develop further things at this point, logistics and supply chain. So lots of opportunities. And here's another chart as well. So what are the leading AI cases for your business? So travel and hospitality are pretty big, customer care and support. So by industry broken down, and I kind of wanted to share this with you and not necessarily go over this in detail, but I think it's pretty interesting to see um, there are no areas of business that are not touched um, by um, artificial intelligence. And there are a number of, if you Google startups that have to do with, if you Google AI startups that have to do with any of these uh, industries, you will find uh, lots of examples of people that, of businesses that have received funding over the last two to three years um, to kind of uh, push this forward. So first one is, First one, so artificial intelligence, and I do feel like, and sorry, as an academic, I kind of feel like I need to start off with a little bit of a definition. And so uh, artificial intelligence is the science of making computers do things that require intelligence when done by human beings. I like to say it's code that can learn. And I do mean literally learn. So it learns over time with lots of examples and lots of data sources. Um, the difference between uh, ourselves and artificial intelligence is that artificial intelligence can learn uh, much faster with a much greater amount of data. And we'll go into that a little bit later. So there's two types of artificial intelligence. One is machine learning and the other is deep learning. 
And so machine learning is, um, metaphorically, it's really machine learning is kind of the toddler. I can teach the toddler five, 10 things to do pretty regularly and it does them pretty well. Um, and then that's good. But I'm not gonna ask um, a toddler um, very difficult questions because they've got very specific model in mind. Then we've got deep learning. And I think of deep learning as kind of the college students. Um, here at Daniels, we create college students that float. So she's floating right now, so that's good. So um, these are good metaphors. So deep learning, so college students solving complicated problems, resolving um, complex issues. And so we're, at, we're just the beginning phases of deep learning and we're kind of neck deep into deep learning as well. So um, for machine learning, it's software that utilizes algorithms to create regression, regression models to identify patterns and classify items. So the simplest metaphor I can think of to explain how the model and parameters and the learner system works is that, so if we think about, I'm gonna drive my car from point A to point B, that is the model. I'm gonna be driving from this point to this point to this point. And the streets that I drive on and the lights and um, stop signs, et cetera, those are the parameters. And then there's a learner portion of the system that actually gives it feedback to say, hey, you didn't do that right. Uh, or uh, there was an error along the way and we're gonna go ahead and fix that. So um, driverless cars are a great example of machine learning. And so my point is there's a lot of things you can do with machine learning. It's a very, very capable way to kind of um, handle business aspects. So that's machine learning. Um, this is an example of a machine learning based company and some of the, some of the things that are being done um, in the industry right now. So this is an email from Tina James and I reached out to them, them being import.io. I just said, hey, I'd really like to get my students access to this tool that basically helps you pull data from websites and puts it into nicely organized data sets uh, in Excel. And so when I got on the phone with um, Rebecca, it was pretty interesting. I got on the phone with Rebecca and, and uh, we started talking about artificial intelligence somehow. And, and she goes, yeah, Tina's a bot. And I'm like, what does that mean? She goes, well, Tina's a bot. So Tina handles all of my incoming uh, uh, messages that have to do with uh, uh, calendar appointments. Um, so she has access to my calendar, access to my email, and I get to pick the gender and the name and all that. And so the company that does that is called Clara. And Clara, if you walk through, it's Clara Labs, C-L-A-R-A labs.com. And so you can walk through this. And last I heard, I think it was $50 a month. You could sign up to have Clara basically be your personal assistant in regards to scheduling meetings for you. And, um, and I think, I mean, I don't know about you, but from this interaction here, I had no idea that I was actually speaking to uh, a bot. I had no no concept whatsoever. So that's one of the ways as far as operational excellence and kind of ma you know, managing times that uh, machine learning is being used. Um, we've all familiar with uh, Amazon's warehouses. So um, those things, and there's been lots of, uh, CBS did something I think in 2016 about how efficient they are and these racks slide around and there's bots rolling around and all that. So um, it's pretty amazing as to how that's being used. And what I, what I would say is with the, the increase in awareness around Amazon's working conditions for uh, at COVID times, um, I would expect this to accelerate. Um, Amazon is, does not take disruption to its business model very kindly. So um, I know they were trying to organize a strike and pretty soon, I think, um, you're gonna see a lot more, um, a lot, a lot more uh, automation going on than currently exists just to get uh, around people being sick or having to worry about that or having to worry about public opinion. Um, Slack is another company that's using machine learning. Camilla, do you have a question? Yes, Mike, do you mind if I interrupt you? Uh, I don't mean to interrupt the, the okay. presentation, but people were asking if you could explain what is a bot before we continue. You bet. So a bot is a small piece of code that uses machine learning to answer questions. And so I will get to an example of how Microsoft can help you stand up a bot. But anytime you're chatting with a business, um, um, there's a chance that it might be a bot. So what a lot of businesses do is they'll let a bot handle the first five or six interactions about some very basic questions. And then after that, um, if, the, if, the, if the questions get a little more difficult, then uh, an actual operator will step in and start to respond. So um, bots are, chat bots are used um, in many, many businesses. And again, I'll show you a Microsoft tool that basically reads your FAQ and creates a bot based on that FAQ. 
So it's a pretty cool thing to do if, um, because a lot of people uh, don't want to experience the phone tree of death and they don't, and they don't want to send an email and not hear back for a week. So uh, people tend to stand up a bot, so I apologize. And yeah, feel free to interrupt um, if I'm going too quickly. So this is interesting, so this is Slack, and Slack acquired um, a company two years ago based out of Denver to help automate the workflow. So um, if you're not familiar with Slack, Slack is a, um, Slack is a messaging, uh, messaging communication platform that looks a lot like Microsoft Teams. Um, instead of having to deal with people across disparate systems and um, you know, so-and-so is on Skype and such and such is on text and I have to call this person, all that. Um, Slack kind of unifies all that. And for those that don't know, they do offer this kind of workflow optimization. So what you can do is, so it says it's all happening in the channel, follow along with everything related to individual topics, projects, or teams. So it pulls what's most relevant out for you um, in Slack to show you what you should be uh, thinking about focusing on right now as far as priorities and just kind of getting general information. Um, Slack is one of those businesses in Denver that's moved here recently. So um, I have a couple friends that are using this and it, um, they really appreciate um, kind of the clarity it provides because the bigger the company gets, the larger the Slack mess can get. So I think it's um, slowly getting better. Um, I think this in there says nothing to do with business, but this is an interesting piece. This little piece of artwork was generated by three people um, that used an artificial, that used an AI and this, um, and to create this artwork. And this piece of artwork sold at uh, Christie's for $432,000. So somebody just used a very simple, this AI generated print sold, et cetera. So uh, 40 times more than expected to fetch. I'm sure there was some novelty to it, but at the same time, um, my point about this is uh, if you are a creative and you think that your job is safe bec uh, because AI can't do creative, it actually can. Um, there's a lot of evidence to show that um, uh, uh, creativity can be taught. Um, some people have a proclivity for it more than others, just like any other skill. But um, when we were at South by Southwest two years ago, there was an AI that designed a music video. So the recording artist obviously recorded the song. The AI picked the actors, it picked the scenes, it picked the camera angles, and then they had human beings string it together. So we're um, pretty close to having a fully functional um, creative suite in many ways uh, for video and imagery, image production as well. So this one is, and so I put these up, so someone asked, um, which is thematic and it's great timing, someone asked what a bot is. These are examples what are known as God bots. And so these are the bots that will be the most relevant in your time. And so what's happening is we're going from a text-based chatbot situation to an audio bot based situation. So we have Google, Alexa, Siri, and Cortana. And so the um, more and more companies are going to be, as obviously as individuals, what's happened recently over the last 10 years is you have this great tech at home and then you're like, well, I want this in the workplace. So these are obviously going after consumers and primarily to feed you the right types of advertising at the right place and time. But over time, I can see these also offering business services um, above and beyond what they do today. So um, when you think of bot, I would think of Alexa um, and Google and et cetera. So if you're interested in kind of seeing how machine learning works like in action, if you click on this link, it'll take you to a Google tool called the Teachable Machine. And the Teachable Machine basically just kind of walks you through the process of how to go ahead and teach a machine learning bot, bot um, how, what something is. And so in other words, um, there's lots of stories like to show, to teach a bot what a cat was, they had to show, a, you had to show this piece of software, um, uh, a pictures, you know, millions of pictures of cats or thousands of pictures of cats till it figured it out. Um, these types of technologies, learning technologies, AI in general, um, need lots of examples to learn. So that's a pretty good example to go through or kind of experiment to go through. Um, this is what I talked about, the Q&A maker. So from FAA, FAQ to bot and minutes. If you click on this, it'll take you to Microsoft's website and it does, um, I haven't actually played with this, um, but what it basically says is from data to bot in minutes. And so um, what it'll do is it'll extract meaning from your, uh, your FAQ and we'll post that onto your website. So when someone comes and has a question or someone's on your website on their phone, and they have their chatting questions, you can stand this bot up 
and uh, let it answer those questions. Camilla, I'm sorry, I see we have a question. Well, we have several questions. Uh, you can continue if you want and we can get to them at the end, but whatever you prefer. Uh, let's do it now. Okay, let's, let's do the first one. So Hannah um, says, can you explain more about why there is a projected decline in AI for sales and marketing? Oh boy, um, without reading that article, I can't. I know that, um, you know, it's funny. So my experience with sales is that automation is great, but at the end of the day, it's about rapport. And so I need to be able to um, figure out how to get that, get that person to a person after I've had my initial questions answered by something AI based. And so, and so, but here's, and the other thing to think about Hannah is that, so that number was from 2019 to, to 2020 or 2022. Mm -hmm. If we went back to 2016 to 20, uh, 2019, sales might have had the highest peak. So I think it has to do with awareness of what the technology can do and the willingness to invest. I wouldn't say that it's going to be in the decline as far as a sales doesn't need AI tools. I don't think that's what that says. I feel like a lot of money was spent up front um, in the mid 2000, 2010s to actually get them to where they are now. So. Okay. Um, Okay, I'll jump to, to the next question we have here. So Bill is asking, how do you define AI as compared to algorithms or statistical models? You bet. So, and actually, and that's, I'm going to answer that question next by going through okay. the rest of this. And that's from Bill? That is from Bill, yes. Okay, Bill, uh, Bill, flag me if I don't answer that question, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to do it in the next two or three slides. Anybody, who's, who else? We also have questions from Corbin and Katusha, and Corbin is asking, would you consider universal basic income a way forward for people that will be displaced because of AI? I understand that's a huge topic, so a general opinion would be fine. Yeah, here's the deal, and I, that's a fantastic question. For those of you that don't know, Hawaii's been playing with this, and Andrew Yang, when he was running for president, was doing it, and then recently everybody got a check for, a certain number of people got a check for 1200 hours and kids got to check for 500 if they qualified. Um, the thought is we need to figure out a way to support people that are going to be displaced um, like truck drivers um, from these jobs in such a way that allows them to feed themselves. Um, it's hard for me and I, um, I'm not at all going to get political, but I mean, it's interesting to think about. Um, I'll say it this way. So there is an AI that diagnoses cancer better than a doc, cancer doctor with 15 years of experience. So if you just think about that for a second, and you think about the time and energy that that person has put into his or her education, that's a pretty big deal. And so $1,500 is probably not gonna help that person that much, but I think that we're gonna have to look at the impact of what this technology is doing on our culture and on all cultures. Um, the thought of just stopping it doesn't make any sense because it is an international um, effort and you're not going to get everybody to stop. Um, and so I'm very curious to see what happens. There's a lot of argument to be made for there will be new jobs created. Um, when I press into people and go, what are exactly are those jobs? And they say, we don't know. And to me, I kind of go, okay, and I'm an optimist as well, but at the same time, it's, um, it's an interesting, th uh, interesting thought because of course there will be new jobs created, but to say this is like another, the last industrial revolution is kind of foolish because at no point did the assembly line have the ability to sit up and think for itself and go, wait, we could do this better and we're going to move this piece over here and do this and this. It's not the same thing. So we will touch on that a little bit. Okay. And let me, let me go ahead and go on and we'll get to the end. Um, by the way, just as, a, just as an aside, this is a real challenge to get this into a micro format. Um, it's much better as a much larger format, like a day or a day or two, because the implications are profound. I heard the term post-humanity for the first time about six months ago, and um, that was a moment for me. And wow. so that thought, if you Google post-humanity, it just simply means that human beings aren't necessarily... Um, I'll paraphrase, running the show or the most essential piece, it's interesting to think about. And um, being a little biased, I'm, I'm like, but human beings kind of are important, but it's an interesting conversation. Yeah, I don't want to think. Um, if you're interested in implementing um, any machine-based learning services for your business and you do not have, you know, oceans of developers that work for you, you can uh, plug your 
plug your business into machine, uh, machine learning through Amazon's web services. And so I'm gonna scroll down a little bit. I'm gonna go through this, but they've got ML services, AI services, frameworks, compute. We've got a whole bunch of things. But if you go down here, this is where the meat and potatoes is. It's got recommendation engines. You can do some forecasting. They can do image and video analysis, um, transcription, translation, voice, document analysis, all of this. And about the voice part too, Amazon recently got their voice SDK, which is a software development kit, small enough that you could put it on just about anything. And so, and that's been a big problem with AI services. And that's why when you ask Siri to play a song for you or do something for you, if you're not connected to the internet, she goes, I can't help you. That service is so um, big that it has to live in the cloud somewhere and that's why it can't do it for you unless you're connected. So if you're interested in machine learning based businesses, this is something I would take a look at for sure. And so let me, uh, let's go forward with this. So we'll talk about deep learning and deep learning again is the deep, deeper end of the pool. It's the floating college student. It's I can solve complicated problems um, and kind of work through things. And the way it works is they basically imitated, they imitated nature and what they did was they said, why don't we just imitate how a neuron works? So this here, this is a neuron nerve cell. It's a neuron and this is an input coming in and then out are signals going out, but those are weighted, weighted as opposed to what's most important, right? So if I put my hand on the stove and it's on and I burn my hand, one of these is gonna say, pull your hand back as fast as humanly possible and that's gonna be the biggest weight and I pull it back. That's a very, very brutal example of how it works, but essentially that's how it works. So what developers did is they started to think, well, why don't we code that way? We have an input and it goes in here and then we have weighted outputs. And so, and that's how this, uh, that's how algorithms and um, um, deep learning started. And from there, it got into a little bit more comp complex models, input one, input two, and these are all weighted and they're going to these other layers to work through. And pretty quickly, you can get to something that's this complicated. But what's funny about this complicated is it's actually not as complicated as you think. So if there were 30 of us, let's say there's 10 of us in a room, and we said, hey, let's go to dinner, right, pretty quickly, you'd go, okay, so right here, let's go to dinner. Uh, who, who doesn't like certain cuisine? How much money does everybody have? What's the purpose of the dinner? Is it business dinner? Is it fun? Um, what's the location? Where are we gonna have to drive 20 minutes to get somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. And you just work down all of these, and this is how decisions are made anyway. And so again, through code, imitating how things work, that's how we got to this kind of deeper layer. And the difference between deep learning and machine learning is deep learning is a subset of machine learning. It just happens to use more complicated, more, um, and I'll say the word organic algorithms that kind of um, get to better answers faster or answers faster. So some examples of companies that use AI Lite, one is called Persado and Persado does um, content. And so we have used Persado with clients in the past and what Persado did for us was they actually helped us generate um, email content. And then what we did was we A-B tested that email content until we got to a certain ROI with a select uh, multivariate group. And then from there it sent out all the rest. So they specialize in getting content that will build engagement. Um, been around for a while and pretty good company and lots of, lots of kudos on their banner. Yeah, StubHub, Travelocity, Humana, hotels, etc. cetera. So um, Prasado's pretty good. Um, there is a local company called Turbine Labs and Turbine Labs does some interesting things. They produce, and it's right here, it's Truth is Our North Star. Um, that's a fancy way to say that they have this AI that actually strips out all bias. And what it does is it reads, and I'll say it bluntly, it just kind of reads the internet. And so, and it pulls out bias and, and tells you exactly what's going on or can tell you what the, what the positive bias or the negative bias is based on what your needs are. And they primarily work with Fortune 500 companies and they produce this little tiny two or three page report that talks about, in general, what the, um, what the opinion is of your new product release of your promotion strategy that you're working on, anything like that, it's pretty interesting. Um, they also have been doing this thing, if you click on the link to the blog, they've also been doing this thing to strip out bias and kind of report on what's going on with the COVID virus. So they put out a daily briefing, and so they're trying to give, you, give it to you as objectively as possible. 
Um, and what's interesting, so and I think I mentioned it a little bit, what's interesting about this AI is, um, and a lot of AIs, is their ability, its ability to take information in. So if I said to Camilla, I said, listen, I need you to go read the Library of Congress and tell me what it says, Camilla would need probably three or four lifetimes and she'd come back real tired and, and probably pretty angry at me. Um, if I asked an AI to read the Library of Congress, it could take, I don't know, it depends on the size, the computing power, and a lot of other variables, but it could take a week, could take a day. So Turbine Labs, their little AI can actually read uh, War and Peace in seven seconds. So the, the point about all of this really is, I, instead of being human and limited with my gray matter, I can pull from all the data sources that are possible and figure out what should work and what might work best and then test it out. So that is the power of AI in general. Um, and then we got another one, Delta. This is one that came up. Uh, so they're expanding their facial recognition boarding on new airports. Um, I, I think, yeah, it was Atlanta. They um, were experimenting with it, which is it scans your face and it recognizes it's you and lets you on the plane. Um, a lot of people don't like this kind of thing. Um, I, I'm not running from the law, so I don't necessarily care if they scan my face, if it helps me get on the plane any faster than currently I'm, I'm down for it. Um, several companies, okay, I'm sorry, states including, or cities, including San Francisco have outlawed this technology until, until I think there's uh, better laws around it, protecting privacy and those kinds of things. So this is what I would consider a very narrow um, kind of application that works for me. Uh, this is an interesting one. So um, this is usually where I ask the class, what is this? And no one can guess. Some of the people say a really cool coffee table. Um, it's not a coffee table. It is, in fact, uh, it, in fact, is, well, we'll talk about this. So what they did is that they asked this AI to design these machined parts. So I've got a part here that a human being created, but they said, I want you to create the same part, but it can be, it can be lighter but it can't be any weaker. So in many cases, it was 50 to 70 times, 75 times stronger. And so this is a piece that does the same essential thing, but it was generated by an AI, in this case, through 3D printing. So what's interesting about this is that if you go down here, this is more and more applicable. So this is a car frame, super rigid, yet super light. Um, actually, super flexible, super light, but super strong. So the design on the right, the antenna is twice as effective. It's the one on the left, it's a bike neck. And this one actually happens to be a lightweight engine block. So, if, so for businesses that are business people that are quant focused, that's fantastic. But I have to tell you, computers and AI can actually love rules-based math. And there's a host of startups that are going after the engineering field right now as far as uh, mechanical engineering. So we'll see how that goes. Camilla, did you want to ask me a question you want me to wait? Yeah, so we're running out of time. Um, we might have time for one question, uh, but I don't want to interrupt your presentation if you feel like you're coming to the end of it. Um, let's see. I, I'm sort of close. So here's the deal. I'm going to do this auctioneer style. Ready? Everybody yeah. put your seatbelts on. It's going to be fine. <laughs> so I want you to know that Google, uh, Google is run by RankBrain, which is an AI. They also have a concept of neural matching in there, which means basically a big synonym engine. So if I add Google University, it'll come up with college. So keywords are gonna mean a lot less for businesses when it comes to search engine marketing. Um, many of you should be thinking right now, what should I be doing? First thing I'd be doing is talk to as many experts as you can. I would get plugged in and I'm about to give you a way to do that. And your future job for the next five to 10 years is really gonna be, so what questions are you trying to answer? So you still need to be a subject matter expert. So education is still important. Training is still important, all of those. So you need to figure out what questions you're answering. And because you're a subject matter expert, you know what data to feed it, to feed the AI. And then content client-wise, you get to communicate with the customers as to what's going on. So you, jobs in the short term are gonna be fine, but there's gonna be a lot of enhancements with your capability, to which I could say to Camilla, how did our, how did our, uh, how did our program, um, how did our campaign go last year between March and April and Camilla would, Ask the AI in about five minutes, you'd know, as opposed to having to go run a report, it's just much faster. Um, if you're interested in learning more about AI, Elements of AI is put out by the Finnish government. Um, it's a free educational platform that teaches you about um, the AI. This has been kind of a real rough and brief kind of uh, take on it. Google AI is another good one for um, learning about how Google perceives AI and its usage. 
and Udacity, I never know how to pronounce this, but they have training programs for AI if you're interested in it. Um, there's a great series on YouTube called The Age of AI, hosted by Robert Downey Jr. If you uh, have YouTube TV, it's free. If you have, don't, you get to watch three a month for free. It's got about nine episodes. And if you click on this image, there's a link to it. Um, lastly, I will say, well, not lastly, just know that everything I just covered is going to happen much faster because businesses needs to be more efficient and more effective just increased by 100 times because the COVID-19 is putting a lot of pressure on every single business model that there is and it's going to change uh, how things are done in lots and lots of ways. And last but not least, Amara's Law. Amara's Law is an interesting one. It basically says technology will have a much less, much smaller impact in the short term versus much greater impact in the long term. And if you think about it, the internet's a perfect example. So what will happen in about five years, you'll be like, yeah, you know, I saw this webinar with this guy and he said these things and it didn't really happen. And about 20 years from now, um, uh, when things really change, uh, that's when most people will go, oh, wait, wait, I've heard of this and this is what's going on. And quite honestly, I'd love to say it's 20 years. It could be 10. So I apologize for going over. It's very hard to get all that out um, in a short period of time. No, I bet. This is all very interesting. Uh, we will do this. We're going to answer one question and then again, we're going to follow up with you with answers to other questions. The one question that I have here that I thought it was interesting um, is from Stephanie and she asks, if COVID-19 becomes an excuse to automate more jobs via AI, will there be a declining jobs for people in man-made work? In what kind of work? Man-made yeah, well, I would say this. I mean, there's, there's, there's craftsmen, right? So there's the makers and, and kind of artisanal work. I think there'll still be a need for that. But I mean, I, I don't see, I really don't see unless, I just don't see how what's happening with COVID-19 is going to make businesses <clears throat> want to be less efficient. I just don't see that. And I see, and I feel like, um, they're going to review what works and what doesn't work and what, what the new norm is and whatever that means based on, you know, the industry that you're talking about. I think about the travel industry. I mean, we're all going to have to sit every other seat. And so plane tickets are going to be twice, I mean, you know, in theory, mathematically twice as much. So I just don't see um, those things recovering. I, I see them, I see them existing, but I just don't see those things recovering from this and I, and I and to me this really is the accelerant on the change yeah perfect well mike thanks so much for being with us again thank you if very you much like, it was great oh, to uh, share this with all of you yeah thank you well if you liked this webinar please join us again next thursday may 7 where ali boyd will be teaching on providing excellent coaching and feedback and on Thursday, May 14, Bo Starosa will be with, with us and talking to us about team resilience. We will be following up with more information on this webinar, key resources, the presentation, everything you need. And once again, thank you for joining us today. We hope you gain new insight that will accelerate your impact in your community, your organization, and the world. From the University of Denver Daniels College of Business Executive Education Department, we look forward to seeing you again on the Accelerate webinar series. Thank you.